Welcome, welcome. Yep. Okay, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and get this started. Um, today we are privileged uh, to have a really wonderful guest speaker. I'm going to, I've asked Dr. Tim Phipps to introduce him, so I'm not going to uh, steal that thunder. But I have been asked to be sure to acknowledge, make a few acknowledgements. Uh, so this, this uh, event has been sponsored by the Institute of Water Security and Science. Uh, Davis College and the Media Innovation Center, uh, as well as the Dan and Betsy Brown Speaker Fund, and also the National Science Foundation uh, EPSCoR program. Uh, so thanks again for everyone uh, being here. And don't forget to sign in. There's a sign-in sheet somewhere floating around, or it might be out front. Um, front desk, thanks, Laura. And great, by the way, greatest thanks to Laura Tinney for helping to organize uh, the event through the Institute uh, Grants Office. Uh, thanks again for everyone being here. Don't forget to grab cookies on your way out because there's a big pile of them out there still. Uh, so with that, I am quite, quite pleased to introduce Dr. Timothy Phipps, who will introduce our guest speaker. You're tall, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming out today. Uh, I think we have a really nice seminar, and I realize what a busy time of the semester this is. So it's nice to see the turnout. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Hoffman, who's going to be giving today's presentation. I met Mike 10 years ago at a National Experiment Station director's meeting in Oklahoma City. Uh, we were both associate deans for research at our respective colleges at that time. We met at Mickey Mantle's Steakhouse, of all places, uh, in the old section of uh, Oklahoma City. Had a delightful conversation, and I got to know a lot about Mike and his really interesting background. Uh, I also got to know why my colleagues had warned me not to ask Mike if he had heard any new jokes. So consider yourselves warned. To me, Mike re represents the consummate 21st century scientist. To start with, he has established a strong research record in his two disciplines of entomology and plant protection. Mike received his BS degree from University of Wisconsin, his MS, University of Arizona, and his PhD from University of California, Davis. He moves to the ranks from assistant to full professor at Cornell. He has over 100 referee journal articles, plus numerous other publications. He holds three patents, serves on several editorial boards, and has won numerous awards for the quality of his research and his leadership. He serves as director of the Cornell Agricultural Experiment Station, and now, in addition to his faculty appointment in entomology, he serves as the executive director of the Cornell Institute for Climate Change and Agriculture. The reason I call Mike a consummate 21st century scientist is that a highly successful academic career, which Mike has had, was not sufficient. When he was director, he led a campus-wide effort to increase energy efficiency and operating costs at Cornell. He became convinced, that usually just happens when I play guitar. <laughs> when he was direct, okay, uh, he became convinced that climate change is one of the biggest challenges that face us today, and he also decided to do something about it. He started a center and incorporated climate change and leadership into his coursework. We hear a lot more today about what Mike has done in his presentation. He's also traveled extensively, carrying his message to diverse groups, including farmers, agricultural organizations, veterans, and the general public. He's a superb communicator, and he's able to deal with audiences that would normally be highly dismissive of the ideas of global warming and climate change. He's able to draw people together in a common cause of improving and protecting the quality of life for our children and future generations. He's a unifier, not a divider which is a rare but very important quality in today's world. Mike? Thank you, Tim, very much. Sure you got the, you sure you got the right guy? Appreciate your comments. I'm going to turn this on now and not cause that. There. Um, Thanks again. Do I have a choice? This one. You? 
Come on. I'll get it. Now can you hear me? Talk. Okay. There we go. Um, thank you. Oh, I can start over. <laughs> oh no. That's another joke, but we won't go there. Um, so yeah, a bit of a roller coaster ride. But again, someone asked at lunch when the graduate students were. But anyway, I explained the way I tell climate change story is like talking to your brother or sister or aunt or uncle, not necessarily a scientist, but in a way that everybody can understand. So that's what I'm going to try to do this afternoon. Um, they offered me a few more minutes, so I'm going to take it, so we'll hold the questions till the end, but hopefully there'll be enough time. That's, it's not too loud, right? Are we doing okay? Okay. And when I said roller coaster, we're going to go downhill, because when you really get into climate change, it can be a little depressing when you absorb all that's happening. So we're going to go there, but then we're going to come back up with solutions at the, at the end. We're also going out to dinner. How many have their Visa cards with them? It's going to be expensive. But the point is to talk about what's happening to our menu. You ready? Remember, we're going to go down, we're going to come back up. I gave one of these talks one time and I said, you never brought us back up. Whoop. He said, don't hit that button right there. Uh-oh. Let's see here. There we go. Did you see what just happened? Okay. It's a miracle. A little bit more about my background. There I am in Costa Rica milking a cow. I grew up on a small farm in Wisconsin. Just how small was it, Mike? We had one cow. <laughs> and of course, Dad had me milk that cow every morning, every night, through grade school, part of high school. But this was a while ago, but our farm was probably 20 years behind the times. My mother made butter, so I have a farming is in my blood. Um, but I blew the tour guide away because I could milk a cow. It's like riding a, riding a bike. You never forget how to milk a cow. And up in the far left-hand corner is, the, is an anaerobic digester. You put manure in this big bladder, it produces methane, and I got all excited about that. So milking a cow and getting excited about the manure, I was an unusual tourist. Uh, so the small farm had a pet crow named Carl. Real, realized recently it could have been Carla, but we never talked. Um, Went to college one year. Dad said, just be consistent. You don't have to be good. I got straight C's for two semesters. I quit and I joined this organization called the Marine Corps. This was during the Vietnam War, so I went and also spent a year in Vietnam. A little bit of life journey. Uh, then I, as Tim mentioned, took leadership roles at Cornell. And like a CEO or in your leadership position, you better see the big picture. And climate change is part of that big picture. If you want to stay in business today, you better be thinking about it. And if you want to lead in the land grant system, it ought to be part of our culture as well. Climate change is personal. Anybody out there care about someone younger than thems themselves? Child, granddaughter? Would you mind whispering their name? Now say it out loud. Just think about that as we proceed. It's not this vague next generation. It's my daughters, your daughters, your grandkids. And lastly, homeland security. 
What's the slogan? We see it in airports all the time. If you see something, say something, and I'm here to say something. <laughs> Telling the truth. I like this quote from Edward Abbey. Better a cruel truth than a comfortable delusion. What's this? Oh, how many were born here? How many went to school here? This is it. There ain't no planet B. Carl Sagan, our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. This is it. Now this is the technical part. We live in a little blanket called the troposphere, the orange band on the surface of the Earth. Right here, it's about six miles high. That's it. That's where all the action occurs for climate change, all the weather. And I'm glad I'm seeing a couple of meteorologists going. And so you got solar radiation coming down. If it hits a snowy field, most of that energy is reflected back up. But if it hits the top of your car, blacktop road, or some dark surface, that heats up and it radiant energy then goes upwards back into the atmosphere. If it hits greenhouse gases, they absorb some of that, they vibrate, re-radiate in all directions, some of that back. We've had just the right concentration of greenhouse gases in that thin blanket for a long, long time so that the temperature was just right for agriculture, for us to build our cities, transportation systems, et cetera. But now we're adding more greenhouse gases to that thin blanket. It's getting thicker. We're holding more heat. It's like putting another blanket on bed during the wintertime to hold that radiant heat in. Anybody see jet trails in the morning? This is, I was walking to work a while back. So if you see a nice clean jet trail, and it's probably about 30,000 feet, that's more or less the top of the troposphere, to give you an idea, just the space we live in. So this is a graph of the change in concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from about the year 1000 to current times. So we've been tooling around 270, 280 for a long time. This is when the Industrial Revolution started. We started burning more coal, oil, natural gas, pumping more CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's increased exponentially. As of March, we're at 408 parts per million. We should be at 270. That's the highest in millions of years. If we continue as business as usual, we'll reach 900 parts per million by the end of the century. And for, let's say, upstate New York, that's about two months above 90 degrees in the summertime. A lot warmer. Nothing new. There were researchers back in the 1800s that understand, understood the concept of greenhouse gases. 97 out of 100 experts agree this is happening. It's caused by humans. And there are other greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide. So it's happening, and it's going to get worse given the trajectory we are on. More recent data, looking, this is the Keeling curve. It's a father and son uh, pair out of Hawaii that have been looking carefully at CO2 concentrations from 1957 to current times, and it's clear. We're going up. Anybody know why it's sawtooth? Summertime. The northern hemisphere greens up and absorbs CO2, and it drops down. Wintertime, it goes back up. The relationship between CO2 and temperature is shown here. The top red line is CO2 starting about 400,000 years ago. This is based on bubbles of air atmosphere captured in ice cores taken from glaciers. So that's essentially a little sample of the atmosphere from way back when. Some of these cores have gone down two miles. And they can measure the CO2 change for a long time back, starting again 400,000 years ago. Temperature couldn't be measured. We don't have that. They use proxy information to estimate temperature. And the, the point is, CO2 goes down, temperature goes down, CO2 goes up, so does temperature. So they're closely linked. Where does it come from? Well, we, in the US, these are EPA numbers, which I, I do believe. 
But as far as uh, transportation is a big one, about 25% of our greenhouse gases come from transportation, the things we like to do, to drive, to fly. We have 1.1 billion cars on the planet. Anybody, I, I lost money doing this, but I used to put up a $20 bill. Anybody could say how many cars, new cars are built every day on the planet. I don't have any $20 bills, 186,000 new cars a day. Um, 100,000 flights a day. Anyway, transportation is big, electricity is big, industrial use is 21%, agriculture 9%. And in the, this is in the US globally, it's about double that. And it also depends, I had conversation today on how you measure this. This is just on farm releases of greenhouse gases. This is not transportation, that's not how nitrous oxide is, or nitrogen fertilizer is produced, et cetera. So if we summarize, we've gained 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since the Industrial Revolution. It's warming twice as fast at the poles. I'll get to that a little later. 2016 was the hottest year, 2017 the next hottest. Summers are warming. Winters are actually warming faster than summers. The rate of warming is fast. We had an ice age about 12,000 years ago and we gained Eight degrees since then, we're going to gain eight degrees in the next hundred years. Again, if we keep on the, this current trajectory. If we behaved and closed down all releases of all greenhouse gases today, it would still take a long time to recalibrate the entire system. And the last one is really important. Weather is what's happening outside today. Climate change is over decades. So we could have three cold winters. Doesn't mean climate change is going away. It's longer term. The evidence is all around us. Nature's best thermometer, perhaps its most sensitive and unambiguous indicator of climate change is ice. It asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debate. It is not burdened by ideology and carries no political baggage. If it changes from a liquid to a solid, it just melts. Anybody seen my TEDx talk? Okay, some of this was used there, but there I had it memorized. So ice melts when it gets hot, and we are in the great melt. Glaciers worldwide, with some exceptions, are retreating fast and melting. That summer melt water from glaciers is important for agriculture. Uh, let's just pick Peru and Chile, where we in fact get a lot of fruit and vegetables, especially Europe more so than we do. Agriculture has actually expanded there because the glaciers are melting faster. There's more runoff, more water for irrigation, but in a few decades, those glaciers will disappear and things are going to change. I think blueberries have expanded. I think it's in Peru. They have 50,000 acres of blueberries. When I go shopping, I look where everything's from. Do you have Wegmans here? Wegmans? You do? No? Oh, I see someone frowning. No, we don't have Wegmans here. It's a real special store. Uh, but that's when I go, I just look at the labels and push the cart. So glaciers are melting. It's also important to hydroelectric power. Columbia gets over two-thirds of its energy from meltwaters. Again, when those disappear, that's going to have another effect. This is summer sea ice in the Arctic. The white area is to the left. Most of that is floating ice. It's the summer sea ice. It's at its minimal. In other words, it's melted as much as it's going to, and it'll start to refreeze as winter approaches. The yellow line or orange line is where it should be. That's the historical average. So as I mentioned earlier, now what's happening, you've got 700,000 square miles of open blue ocean exposed to incoming solar radiation. It is warming up. It melts more ice. You get the picture. So in a few decades, there won't be any summer sea ice in the Arctic. We're all kind of going downhill now. Still OK? Greenland also melting. It's a massive chunk of ice. They're lo it's losing about 50 cubic miles of ice a year to melting. It is also such a large mass of ice that it has its own gravitational force, so it's actually pulling the ocean in and increasing the depth just by gravitational force. So when that ice disappears, not, not only will there be a lot more water in the ocean, that gravitational force will be lost and that water, water will distribute accordingly. Oceans are rising. Two-thirds of that is from ice cap melting and glacier melting, and the other third is from thermal expansion, warm water expansion. 
And oceans are also acidifying because they're absorbing a lot of carbon dioxide. That challenges especially small, immature, shell-forming creatures. A few years ago, there was a problem in the Pacific Northwest in with the oyster producers that produce the little larvae. They were having collapses. They couldn't. They thought it was a disease, and ultimately they realized it was in these large tanks filled with ocean water. The pH was, in fact, interfering with the development of shells by the oyster, immature oysters. The picture in the upper left is one I took in Colorado when we had our meeting in Estes Park. Tim, I don't know if you were there. <laughs> um, beautiful area, but I had an opportunity to go hiking, and I saw these dead trees, and it didn't take too long to realize they're dead because of an expanding floating bark beetle population throughout the Rockies up into Canada. So, of course, you walk up and you pull the bark back and you see the tunnels, and it's, it's from an entomological standpoint, it's just amazing. Uh, warmer summers, more generations, warmer winters, more survival, drought stress trees, more susceptible, the population has just exploded. This is affecting literally millions and millions of acres of trees in the West. We, anybody follow bark beetles right here? Because I know they're in the Hudson Valley. I'm slowly moving. Anybody aware of what might be occurring here? Okay. Um, there's a certain species starting to move up the Hudson Valley. So even in the north, East will be affected. This picture on the lower left is essentially all the trees are dead. We happened to be hiking in southern Utah this past September, and again, whole mountainsides are all brown from what's happening. That lends itself to some extent to fires. And of course, if you're following any news from the West over the last few years, the number of just fires in general, forest fires in the West and Pacific Northwest have really gone up. And for every degree of warming, it's not an additive effect. As you increase the temperature, it's almost exponential as the risk of fires increases because it's more arid and it's more hot, hotter. Um, this is a picture of the tundra. There's more brush growing because of warmer conditions, which also lends itself to more fires. But wait a minute. Maybe this is just a cycle, a natural, something natural. Well, it turns out the sun is actually in a very slight cooling phase, so that doesn't explain it. We orbit around the sun in an ellipse. We're not getting closer or further away. Or we're not, that doesn't explain it. We all, the planet tips here and there, and it wobbles when you get ice ages, but none of that is occurring to explain this. A volcano would have a cooling effect because it's putting all that particulate matter in the atmosphere and reflecting sun, and the experts understand these other natural cycles, El Nino and La Nino. So we are well beyond any kind of natural cause for what we are seeing. So let's move on now to the things, to agriculture and food. So with all these changes, agriculture is no longer business as usual. There's more risk, more variability, impacts local to global. And a few years ago, I had the chance to meet at that time the president of Kraft Foods, pretty big company, and I, I always bring up climate change. And the president paused and she said, hmm, price volatility is costing us $3 billion a year. We're a big company, but that's a lot of money. And that is due to having a source in a certain part of the world and that's not available. You've got to pay much more for it. So the volatility was really affecting that company. So a couple of things that are happening. One is if, if you're a gardener or a farmer, you often look at planting zones that's based on winter temperatures. But in general, because of warming temperatures, the planting zones have actually moved one zone north. If you find West Virginia on there, you can see the change in color between 1990 and 2006. Essentially, it's become warmer. The Canadians are really enjoying the change north of the Dakotas because now they can grow crops they couldn't grow before. They're expanding some of their grain crop. So production is shifting north. We have a longer growing season from the last frost in the spring to the first frost in the fall. It's getting, a, the time between those two events is longer. We've gained about 10 days in the northeast and out west about 20 days. So this can mean maybe double cropping for some farmers. It can mean different crops. 
Um, so it can be seen as a bit of, in a positive light. But we're also incurring more heavy precipitation events. This is like the top 1% of heavy downpours. We're up 71% in the Northeast. So instead of the rain falling gently, it's more often now coming in downpours. Libby Pumpkin, which has their facility in Illinois, a few years ago they couldn't plant because it was too wet in the spring. They lost about half their crop, and a couple years later they couldn't harvest because it was too wet. But they also grow older pumpkins within 90 miles of the processing facility. So there may be some logic in distributing your risk. Don't plant all that close to one location and have that kind of risk posed to your principal ingredient. So this is, poses problems. These heavy downpours wash away soil, nutrients, freshly seeded fields. And this, this person, this farmer, quote, as a farmer you can weather the storm, but you can't weather continuous storms, was interviewed. This is a quote, but the previous day he'd lost $50,000 worth of seed. I'm assuming it was a small seed like alfalfa or something, but it all got washed away. He was not a happy farmer. And our communities are being hit by these storms. This is Penn Yan, uh, five inches of rain in four hours, a lot of damage. The hurricane that hit Houston, people say, well, will there be more hurricanes? That still isn't clear. But the one thing clear about what happened in Houston was the 50 inches of rain. For every degree warming, we gain 4% humidity in the atmosphere. There's more energy, more atmosphere. That's why they got 50 inches of rain. Crop losses, too much moisture. This is between 19, or 2013 and 2016. You can see too much moisture. This is across all crops in the Northeast. They got hit with a 34% loss. Drought, we had a drought year in there. That accounted for 38% loss as well. And um, heat, another one. So this is all associated with more extremes. Too much moisture, not enough moisture. And surprise frost, there's a freeze in there too. I'm assuming that's part of the uh, winter of a few years ago that was fairly warm and then winter returned and New York in particular lost all of its apples. Now we're gonna look to the future. If you look at the gray band across the bottom, that essentially contains the average temperatures from average annual temperature from about 1850 to current time. They all fall within that great gray band. The colors thereafter are looking forward. If we look at the red line, which would be that's the worst case scenario, you will see at 2053, see if I can do this right, the coolest temperature will be warmer than any previously recorded warm temperature, warm year. We're essentially moving into a whole new realm. Everybody doing okay? Want a beer or something? I'm watching your faces. I'm watching your faces. Um, let's look at precipitation patterns. This is towards the end of the century. You can find West Virginia on there more or less. And in the winter and spring, You'll actually be getting a little more precipitation than now. In the fall, it'll be about the same. In the summer's drier. We will have water, which is really key in the Northeast, because you look to the west, the southwest, much, much drier. Mexico, Southern California, where a lot of food comes from, is going to get very dry. We actually look at this as an opportunity. I'll get to that a little bit later. Toby Alt, a climate scientist at Cornell, has also published two papers on the pop probability of a mega drought hitting the southwest before the end of the century. 99% chance of a 35-year drought. I'm not going to retire there. <laughs> and lastly, interesting paper on supply choke point. And I'm just going to pick one, the Panama Canal. Because of changes in precipitation patterns and sea level rise, some of our major canals are going to be challenged in the future. Right now, the lake 
that is at the top of the Can Panama Canal that all ships have to go through is actually losing water. And it's going to get challenging for big ships to go through. But the amount of soybean, rice, and wheat that moves through these systems, these choke points, is incredible. So there's a risk in the future to those uh, canals, and, they, and they'll become choke points, potentially. And you hear the argument, well, wait a minute. Carbon dioxide is good for plants, right? Well, up to a point. If you're a C3 plant, most plants are, there's actually a benefit, wheat, rye, oats, barley, potatoes. But the consensus is whatever is gained is going to be offset by more extremes in weather. So we're not going to gain anything by increasing CO2. And Lou Ziska at USDA Beltsville has been doing some really interesting work by growing insects and plants under artificial levels of carbon dioxide. And what he's found is weeds are harder to control with glyphosate Roundup. In fact, at some point, you can't kill a weed growing at a certain high level of CO2 with glyphosate. Insects eat more. Turns out probably because there's less protein in the plant so that for a given time, they'll actually eat more than on a, health, than on a plant growing under low CO2. He's looked at, um, I think it's pollen from the fall. Would ragweed be in the fall? And I think whatever they pollen, the major pollen source in the fall for bees, again, growing these plants under different levels of CO2, protein content drops off. Doesn't know what that means to the bee colonies, but it's a change. But the big one is on the bottom. For the last 10, 20 years, there's been an observed decrease in a lot of our staple crops in protein content and an increase in carbs, as well as decrease in some micronutrients. And thought, well, they're just breeding for yield and other things and not worrying about nutrition. Turns out it's caused by higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's about a 9% change, which for most of us isn't a big deal. But if you're in a country where your protein is limited, that is a big deal. Anybody seen this beer? A little bit warmer? It's really good. I recommend it. It comes in a four pack. It's not cheap. And it's seasonal. And I have no idea why it's seasonal. Uh, but I love this little item on the back. Extended refrigeration at retail magnifies beer's carbon footprint. Please enjoy as soon as possible. So when someone's trying to make a dime on something, you know it's got to be real. So this is the final proof, a beer called Global Warmer. Okay, get that Visa card ready. Now we're going to go take out to a, a nice place to eat. But bear in mind, Growing foods are no longer business as usual. Supply chains are changing. More volatility, more risk. We'll start with the good stuff. There are so many neat stories to tell about what's happening. I was invited a, a, a few years ago to speak at the American Craft Beer Distillers Annual Convention in Chicago. The only part I remember is the tasting room. There were 400 options. I made it through free. And you served yourself. Like I said, you know, I expected someone to have these little, no, no, just help yourself. I had already given my seminar, so it was okay. But I just walked in the room and I think I'm going to go to my hotel room. Um, but I was invited because someone heard a talk like this and they said, wait a minute, you're messing with our rye. Where am I going to get rye in the future? Because of wherever they were sourcing at the time. So here's the story. Let's look at olives. Most are grown in the Mediterranean, some in California, and during the drought, it was rough on olives in California. But olives, along with most fruit and nut crops, need a winter dormancy period, a winter chill. California is starting to lose that. There's an estimate that they'll lose about 40% in the next 20, 30 years. California grows a lot of fruit, a lot of nut crops. And if, if the tree doesn't have that winter chill, they don't set blossoms, they don't set fruit, et cetera. So that's, to me, is kind of an ominous thing that's lurking out there. Our Secretary of Agriculture was talking to a climate scientist. And our climate scientist said, you lost all your peaches in Georgia two years ago. I may have you off a little bit. They had no peach crop. The winter was too warm. Sonny Perdue understood that. He's a farmer. Yeah, he said it was too warm. The angels share. 
Anybody ever heard that? So when they uh, put bourbon or whiskey in the big barrels, they hear it out of, essentially out of doors. It's, in a, it's got a roof, they're called rick houses, I think. So they lose a little alcohol evaporation through the oak. That's the angel share. It's getting warmer. The angel's taking a bigger share. Not doom and gloom, not a big deal, but you know, if you're producing a product that has been on the market for a long time and the alcohol content changes, maybe you can fix it, but you know, it makes some people nervous. Agave grown in Mexico, it's a 10-year crop. They're much like California, they had four years of drought. They were really concerned about the quality. And California is gonna be going more and more to the extremes of too much water, not enough, as well as Mexico. So tequila, a little bit compromised. The fruit, if it, in the picture here, if it came from Chile or Colombia, in the future, that's gonna be in trouble. Um, salad, we're moving on. Avocados, price was way up last year and a half because of very, very warm temperatures in California and Mexico. In the long term, uh, I think most avocados will be out of California in about 30 years. Wine, grapes are really sensitive to changes in temperatures. Uh, the Northeast could grow more wine, those that, are, that would tolerate the warmer conditions. Uh, that's what's happening in New York in part. Uh, the cherry tomatoes shown here are really difficult to grow now in upstate New York if they're grown organically. Not, you can't grow them out of doors. If you're a commercial grower and can spray, you're okay, but late blight will come in because of these rains we have in the spring and just pretty much wipe out cherry tomatoes, unless they're grown under plastic, if it's organic. Anybody know what's happening to lobster? The ocean is warming faster off the coast of Maine than most other places on the planet. And of course, lobsters like cold water, so they essentially have moved north, which has had a severe impact on the lobster industry. At the new location, however, the populations are exploding. They're doing really well further north. Shrimp are gone from that area because of warming waters. Rice grown in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, saltwater intrusion, a big deal, coming in about 30, 40 miles upstream. Farmers are switching. If there was saffron in the rice and grown in Kashmir in India, going out of business. Thousands of growers. They grow about 10% of the Kashmir, in, excuse me, 10% of the saffron in the world. Most is grown in Iran, but in India, they're really in trouble because changes in temperature and uh, changes in precipitation. Nobody wants to see the lower left-hand corner of this picture, coffee. 25 million coffee growers, mostly in equatorial countries around the world. Uh, again, changes in when the rain falls, increasing temperature, stressing the crop, and there's a rust fungus that's doing very well in the new conditions as well as an insect. I was talking to, a, cacao is another one, grown in Western Africa, probably will move to Central America. And I was talking to a gentleman in Nicaragua recently, and he says his coffee growers are switching to cacao, but it's a 30-year crop. Where do I put it? What elevation? How do I anticipate climate change? Vanilla, anybody follow the price of vanilla? It also went way up recently because of storms in Madagascar. And you can dig in further and further, but if you, Look hard enough, almost everything on that menu in some way is changing. I'm not saying it's doom and gloom. We can help adapt. We can breed new varieties and so on. But it is changing. OK, so most of us can afford a meal like that. But what if you live where agriculture is rain fed? And you have few resources to adapt. We face a food security challenge, a national security challenge, and a moral challenge. So I had the great fortune to go to Vietnam in January with 10 Cornell students to spend two weeks in the Mekong Delta to see climate change firsthand because Vietnam is one of the top three countries that will be impacted by rising sea and a number of other things related to climate change. It's a land on water in the Mekong. If you want really cheap property, the water on the land, the housing, et cetera, on, right on the shore is where you go because it's at high risk. Just a little side story. 
it was a foggy day. I'm walking by myself on the beach, and I look way up ahead, and it looked like a bunch of rocks coming out. And I thought, well, that'll be the end of my hike. And I got closer and closer, and here's about 50 to 75 fishing boats that had just come in. And I'm there with my iPhone taking all kinds of pictures. And then I remember the guide saying, there's a lot of smuggling here. So I put my phone away. But anyway, I tried to talk to, they all laugh at me. It was fun. It's, the Vietnamese are just wonderful people. So here's some of the students who actually got to go to Washington, D.C. and engage their members of Congress, no matter where they're from, where they were from in the U.S., this was Pennsylvania, Long Island, New Jersey. And they got to talk to the staffers. It was an incredible experience of democracy in action because they talked about climate change. And they, they inspired us. They did such a great job. So Mark said it all here. I felt so embarrassed that I contributed to climate change. This was in Vietnam. That, I, that was destroying their livelihoods. How did they repay me? By inviting me into the home for tea. And we wrote an article in The Hill, and mostly it was included quotes like Marx from their experience. It was, um, and this quote is actually from a meeting we had in Vietnam. It's a communist country. Things are pretty much controlled. But I asked a senior member of the Communist Party, uh, how climate change was perceived in Vietnam. And he said, the science is solid. We understand it's happening. In Vietnam, it's not a hoax. I don't think they expected this to go uh, be used, but this was in the press. The picture of the students, it was a selfie. I think they would have been a little more composed, but they had a good time. All right, we're about ready to turn around and start looking at solutions. But if you want to keep going in this direction, this article in the New York Magazine of July of 17 by David Wallace Wells takes you there. This is beyond the models. It's the tipping points that are out there, the irreversible things that could happen with climate change. There was a lot of uh, communication about that because people said, don't tell everybody all of that. OK, so here we are. Oh, anybody depressed? Overwhelmed? Pretty normal. What can we do? Move? Ignore? Deny? Too busy? Most everyone, hey, I got kids in college, I got things to do, my car's broke down. Life. Don't bother me with this thing, climate change. In reality, it's not part of our DNA, especially if you're thinking about stuff that's far away, both spatially and temporally or time. We don't, it doesn't click. It's got to be immediate. And again, for most of us, not all, life is pretty good. Leave me alone. So let's look at solutions and opportunities. Some of the big food industries get it. They want to stay in business. They got to understand where they're sourcing from. So a number of recommendations from this company, BSR, encourage your, instead of just assuming that cacao, cacao grower is going to do well, you've got to invest in that grower as a producer. Mars Incorporated is investing a billion dollars in their own infrastructure and how they operate, but also in something called climate smart farming. They're worried about their chocolate. Look at the whole the whole supply chain, where's the risk? Practice what you preach in your facilities, conserve energy. Invest in the suppliers, and Ben and Jerry's is actually looking at alternative ingredients. They're looking to the future. What will they have? What will they be missing? So here we are at a land grant university, meeting the challenge through new crops, addressing new pests, looking at soil health, stream weather, water management. I met you know, today someone said, how'd it go? Said, well, I'm at a great university meeting incredible people doing incredible things. Great place to be. So we are part of the response. We can meet the challenge here, Cornell, elsewhere. So here we go, growing food in the Northeast. There will be challenges, more extreme weather, floods, droughts, high temperature, but adequate water, longer seasons, shifts in productivity elsewhere, unfortunately, do we have the potential to expand and diversify? We got almost 25% of the US population up in this area. Is this an opportunity for job creation, economic growth? This is the opportunity angle is oftentimes a message I convey to grower audiences. This might be a chance to really expand. Some recent developments, the USDA created climate change hubs uh, four years ago. Their mission is to help coordinate efforts across the seven different hubs in the US. I'm with the Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions. We are helping farmers adapt and mitigate their impact. 
We're working with Canadians. I'm trying to find common ground, common projects. And just the last one is sort of a minor, maybe not so minor point. We did a MOOC, a massive open online course. Last fall had 2,000 students sign up from 74 countries. Cooperative the second time had 1,500 students, also from over 70 countries. Seems to me there's a, there's a hunger for this kind of information. And it was just basic climate change and also how to talk about climate change. So here, what we're doing at the Climate Smart Farming website and institute is uh, listening to farm, farmers, what their needs are, mostly in New York and the Northeast, and responding. Uh, here's a video. We've done a number of interviews, and this is one of the farmers near Ithaca. A normal season does not seem like it happens anymore. It's either really dry or really wet. It seems like we get rain. It's ap apocalyptic. We got five inches of rain in one and a half hours. I had a lot of loss of soil. I see generate impact for generations. This is someone on the ground making a living off the land. Things are getting tough. We have the first in the country extension team. Each of these individuals dedicates about 10% of their time. We pay, we cover that cost to talk about climate change to their producers, to listen, bring back the needs, and then if we have something new, they help get it out. And these are regional specialists. They cover multiple counties across the state. Several of them, I mean, I have PhDs. I think all, yeah, three of them do. I mean, highly qualified individuals taking that message out to those growing our food. These are some of the tools that have been developed, and I'll go into a couple a little deeper, but so you can go to this website, and there's a new tool on called growing degree day accumulation. Plants are growing faster. This helps estimate that. So anyway, there's several of these tools, both that have been de developed by the Institute in close partnership with faculty and others at Cornell. Some of these are national. So one of them, again, I mentioned the loss of the entire apple crop a few years ago. This farmer goes, puts in their location. If they have a particular date of interest, it'll highlight that and what kind of apples you're growing. And the, the I'm colorblind, so I think it's a gold line, yellow on the bottom. When it's way down low early in March, it's, in, it's essentially dormant, pretty much tolerant of really cold temperatures. But as it warms, it jumps up, so it goes up to a little under 10 degrees, and it's more susceptible to cold temperatures. The blue line is essentially the temperature. And when those cross, it means it's become cold enough to actually result in a 50% loss. So I think they were okay this year, but it, when those line cross, it gives, there's actually now a also predictor component that gives a farmer, the apple grower, about a seven day window, heads up, that this is going to occur. So we're trying to help them minimize their losses due to these surprise freezes. There's something called a water deficit calculator because of the intermittent droughts. Again, you put in your location, you put in soil type, put in the crop type, and if you have irrigation, you indicate that, and it just breaks it out by the top border is no deficit, plant is fine, deficit, no plant stress, Again, I'm going down, plant stress likely, and finally severe plant stress. And it kind of gives you this probability curve that you can look at and kind of intuitively say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be okay or I better irrigate relatively soon. Again, this is a 30-day forecast, which is really important to producers. A lot of farmers put cover crops in, but it's a bit of a guessing game in the fall, like how late can I go? Maybe it's a wet soil, wet condition, you're still harvesting. This helps determine, in this case, if the cover crop is rye, the top, the line along the top when it says 100, if you plant in that time window, you're gonna get 100% stand. If you wait longer, it starts to decrease, and at some point, there's no point in trying to plant that cover crop. This is brand new, it's still experimental. Toby all faculty at leading this, and this is essentially a forecast of when spring will occur across the entire US. And also there is a drought monitor. Anybody follows a drought, this was taken, this was just a few, well, April 10th. You can see there's some pretty severe uh, water shortages out, uh, drought conditions out in the central and western states. Um, but also the point, but what's happening is we are getting a lot of international attention to these, for these tools, especially the drought one. There's uh, most likely funding from FAO, 
uh, to work in Pakistan. There's a lot of interest in, in India and Vietnam. And we had a conference call today that I wasn't on for a pro potential project in Tanzania. So we're excited about these tools benefiting uh, areas far, far removed from the Northeast. So I'm starting to wrap it up. So we're also writing a book on our changing menu, what climate change means to the feed, food we love and need. And it's going to tell this story. First and foremost, it's a celebration of food. Agriculture and the food industry is the largest world, largest industry in the world. It's important to the jobs and the economy. It'll help people understand where food comes from. And that thanks to climate change, things are changing. The idea is to just get the attention. How many of you in here don't eat? Everybody eats. So we're trying to link to that and tell this story. If you want a book that really lays out the solutions, it's called Drawdown. Paul Hawken is the editor. And it goes through all of the options, and it calculates out how much we would draw down the atmospheric CO2 and get us to where we need to be. I think there's a total of 100 options. It's a really uh, useful book that if we implemented all of these things, we could actually make a lot of progress. So it's a grand challenge but one we can tackle if we have the will. If you look at what we've accomplished, we've cured diseases. Gone to the moon, just recently, Jupiter. Rebuilt New York City. Everybody has one, two, three of these smartphones. Incredible tools. We've accomplished engineering feats. Agriculture is amazing in this country. Art. We can do it. We just need the will. And I said it's personal. These are my daughters. What will they say in 2050? Did we try? Thank you. Wait a minute. Shut mine off. Mike, thanks so much. So uh, we do have some time for questions, if there are any. If you don't ask any questions, I'll start telling jokes. Nicholas. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. Thank you for the Can you hear me? OK. Um, thank you for the talk. It was very insightful. Um, I work in hydrology and water resources management, and it's always interesting to reflect on um, the power of the market um, to, to create, to innovate solutions to problems like this. And with agriculture, there's, you know, food is a commodity that's traded and sold, so it has economic value. And so there's incentive to move forward to solving um, food security issues related to climate change. Um, there isn't the same thing with water. You know, we don't have a lot of companies coming in and saying, well, I'm going to fix this water problem because it's good, f because I can make money off of it. Um, so just out of curiosity in your experience, um, working with climate, food, and water, can you provide any insights on uh, maybe um, on the, uh, the, positive, the, the positive side of managing water in absence of actually having an economic drive to do so? Did that make sense? I, I kind of fumbled at the end. Well, let me answer something. OK. No. That, that'll do. I'll no. take it. No. Let me, as you were asking the question, I was uh, also, when I was with the distillers, water's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, point, the, the point was, my next brewery, my next distillery, it's got to have water. So they were, they were kind of shifting even where they were building their facilities. I don't think I'm targeting. But I mean, water, I mean, sometimes that's considered the greatest challenge as opposed to climate change globally. Um, but as far as incentivizing change. Well, there's, the there's, there's no, in, there isn't a direct, a tangible incentive to focus on how to better manage our water resources to secure water where there is for food because there are entire businesses that are built on producing seed, on growing food and selling food and trading food. And we don't have that with water. So how can we take your positive insight on food and translate that to managing water. We'll write a chapter on water in our book.
Well, actually, that, that's not far removed. We, we, one section of the book will, will describe in a little bit depth what, in fact, is happening to our food because of water shortages, increasing CO2, and the change in proteins. It's, it's going to be a sort of a compilation of all of the interesting things that are happening to our food. So that would be one way to do it. And that, that part of the, the massive open online course, I actually did a session on water, too. Because uh, uh, there's, there's really not much fresh water. Most of it's salt water. Oh, Jim. I got the mic. Uh, is it working? OK. <laughs> I can't tell if it's working out, but I assume it is. Uh, West Virginia is a headwater state, and so that's one of the things that uh, you, you've done a lot of work in, and is one of the things that we may be an advantage for us over, over the long term. But uh, one of the things I've really worried about for a long time is uh, ocean health. Ocean health? The question has to do with the, the flow of warm water coming up from the equator and below and circulating cold water going back down. That whole flow is just a massive exchange of cold water, salty water. And it's actually slowing down because of more rainfall, more unsalty water falling and melting Greenland and elsewhere is part of what's changing. I don't know if anybody at Cornell is working on it, but I mean, that's, that's, that's actually one of those, I almost call it a tipping point. You know, when it happens, it's, there's no turning back, and the, the impact on actually would increase sea level rise on the East Coast in some way and affect temperatures in Europe. Well, yeah, 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 yes. Oh, wait a minute, sorry, somebody back. So in your experience, I'm talking about research. We know that in the United States, the research is very well localized. So we think about uh, oranges, you go to Florida. If you think about almonds, you go to California. So with the global changing, what would you recommend the universities to do, especially West Virginia? What do you think we should move into agriculture in this area? I think that's the second time that question came up today. I don't have a list of new crops. Um, I think one thing that will expand is controlled environment agriculture, more greenhouse and hoop house production. That's happened in New York, but that's as much driven by extending the market earlier and later in the year. Um, but I think, quote, local grown will become more important just because of the risk of products coming from elsewhere. Um, and again, I think that that's where, hey, there's an opportunity in this part of the world. Can we plan? Can we think by 2025 we can be growing this? In 2030, that well, if we think strategically, we can we can sort of anticipate when that opportunity hits us. So, um, I can't answer your I can't provide you spe specifics. I mean, they grow canola in north, northern New York; they could never grow it before, and uh, because it's also there's a processing plant in Canada, that's part of it. So things are happening, but it's not necessarily planned. So I'm going to say, the innovators, the farmers, who can think ahead and make those changes, will be ahead of the curve. Is that the right answer? Oh, well, soils, soils are critical, critically important. Carbon capture, I, mean, I mentioned soil health. I, I could go on for another two hours, so I'm, I'll, somebody? Um, I heard a talk recently in respect to the um, Gulf Stream moving northward. And the person who gave the talk said it could easily go into an ice age cycle. It would just depend on which way it would tip. I'm not sure it'll be cooler. It is conceivably North America will cool. I'm not an expert, but I've never read where we would go into an ice age. I don't think it'll be that based on what I've read. 
Thank you for your talk. I, I was reading the last sentence there, climate change, it's time to raise your, our voices. How would you suggest to do that? Watch my how TED Talk. How would you talk. suggest? Sorry? That's my TED Talk. Yes, I know. <laughs> but how would you suggest to, to raise uh, our voices? When people ask, what can I do? That's it. We need to start talking about, OK, we have a community of scientists here doing great things. I don't mean to in any way downplay that. But when it's a, like a general audience, get engaged in the process we have in this country, the democratic process. Uh, we have to raise our voices. And I did this in front of a student, and one guy said, vote. Is that what you mean? Yes. Get involved. Um, also in the TED Talk, I talk about this is my personal opinion. The only way we're going to get through this is with a huge social change, kind of like a great awakening, like we had in you know, the FDR, this World War II. You know, yesterday you made cars, tomorrow you're making tanks. Boom, we're done. But from the ground up, uh, to me, that I think we'll make it happen. Other questions for Mike? Anyone? Michael? Can, can the speed of plant breeding keep up with the climate change? I mean, you talk about we having to use new crops, et cetera. But as we all know, plant breeding isn't necessarily the fastest process. And so is climate change basically outpacing us there? Can yeah, we keep up with plant breeding? Bear with me. I didn't catch the first part of your question. Plant breeding, crop breeding is a relatively slow process. It takes a lot of time. And uh, is climate change basically outpacing us? So can we keep up in our breeding programs with the ongoing climate change? If we are supposed to grow new crops. I hope so. <laughs> Was that a cop out? I mean, it's also people, I haven't heard a cop question about GMOs. You know, that's usually always comes up, and I say that's part of the portfolio. We've got to look at everything. And I'm a proponent of nuclear power, which oftentimes doesn't go over well. Well, it's a good, it's a good question. I'll, I think that's a fun question. Uh, and you know, the question might also be, can, are, are we going to get away uh, without GMOs uh, as we adapt to this, right? The answer is probably no. We want to be realistic, and if that maybe by definition that means we can't, we're not able, to, we may not be able to keep up, right? And so we're gonna have to try other things. Oh, I have a question. Maybe I don't know if you're thinking about this or not. So in the news recently, uh, I read about Russia uh, flooding the wheat market in many places uh, globally. Has anybody else heard about that and seen that? Okay, good. I wasn't dreaming. Uh, well, so some of our some of our work looking at global climate and climate shifts in in my group, uh, we're seeing anomalies uh, and new climates kind of set up in northern Russia, mid northern Russia, and other places. Uh, have you considered that and what that might mean for um, global food competition, changing diets, um, economics? Have you thought? Have you considered that and one more time. <clears throat> How much wood would a woodchuck chuck? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the question is, I've, have you heard of the, the wheat no. flood? You have. You have not. I have not. You have not. OK, yeah. So I guess that, that takes care of that conversation. But it may, maybe somebody else has. It's, a, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Well, if climate's changing uh, in, in mid to northern Russia, and they're able to start flooding the market with wheat to create a, mar a, uh, a market base, uh, that could be a problem. And getting back to Eugenia's question about soils, uh, we could also get off on a nice conversation probably about the fact that we've been shipping our soil out of the Midwest for decades and decades and decades in all the corn and soybeans that we ship out of this country. And of course, to suggest there aren't climate change implications towards that process, you know, we know better. It's a fun, fun topic. Oh, I think I'm heading us back, back downhill again. Sorry about that. Water. And, and, and right, maybe soon shale gas too. Maybe that's another topic. Just, just in case anybody wants that great lake water, it's not for sale. Ungol, yes. And on climate 
climate logist or interest in climate change impact on agriculture, especially in the South Asia region. So you share the climate smart solution for agriculture. So have you experienced you uh, deliver this solution for the uh, a small farmer in India and Vietnam or other parts of Southeast Asia? And if not, what would be the solution for them, especially for the farmer in South Asia and Southeast Asia region? Well, there, there is interest. There's conversations with uh, colleagues in India about some of those tools. Um, I had a preliminary conversation with USAID about also in Vietnam. I mean, these things kind of take time. There's interest in just the fact that people are starting to realize these tools are available. Um, that, you know, hopefully they'll be applied in Vietnam, Bangladesh, wherever. Um, so, yeah, slowly but surely, we can contribute to the needs there. Deliver the solution yep. idea to. Well, I mean, but my two week, well, month long experience total in Vietnam, and much of that focus on climate change. I mean, there's also a lot going on. Uh, salt tolerant rice varieties, a new variety. They've got a huge breeding program in rice um, and other things. So. It, um, you know, but unfortunately, they don't have crop insurance. You get a bad year, it's just especially a loss. So much different than what we do here. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we're about out of time. I just got the uh, the tap to the wristwatch from from Laura, which means we need to I probably start working on vacating, huh? So uh, let's give Mike a great big hand again. And thanks so much. <laughs> and thank you all for being here. Um, Grab cookies on your way out, and, or, and feel free to hover around and ask other questions if you may have some for a few minutes. And th thanks again for being here. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Marin County experiment. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I was aware of it. Yeah. Oh.